and Hillary are in the film, but it's about this vast progressive movement, which has, in a sense, made the long march through the institutions of elementary and secondary education, uh, academia, Hollywood, the media, national public radio, the mainline churches. So sometimes while the conservatives and Republicans are huddling and trying to figure out, gee, how do we take back the Senate? These guys have basically taken over the commanding heights of our culture, and they're conducting a relentless indoctrination campaign against our young people. They're doctoring American history. So the film blows the whistle on this whole menagerie. And, and you were talking about persecution of others. I mean, I've seen MSNBC, we played the clips, say, good, arrest the Tea Party. Good, don't let them be politically involved. Uh, Fox News has reported on Army mem memos at Fort Hood saying, you could be court-martialed if you're part of the Tea Party or evangelical. I mean, this is stuff beyond Cuba, and they're just doing it out in the open, calling it liberal I mean, I can't think of language strong enough to describe this group other than authoritarians. I mean, how would you describe them? I do think that Obama has an authoritarian streak. I th also think from what I now know about him, and I've talked to his relatives, that he's an incredibly mean-spirited and vindictive guy. To give you a small example of how he is, when I was interviewing George Obama uh, in, in, in Nairobi, I later talked to Obama's sister, and she goes, well, you know, we're having George followed. This is, <laughs> the, the family is having one of its own siblings followed. Uh, and there are, so they, there's a paranoid streak going on over there. They look at critics, not as well-meaning people who disagree with them, but as enemies who have to be, in some senses, put out of business. Uh, and so I think this is a very dangerous mentality. Uh, you know, we didn't see it with Clinton. We wouldn't have seen it with Jimmy Carter. O Obama has, in a sense, represents a new low in American politics. He's up the ante. In fact, uh, that was an article I think I saw in Variety. Uh, we can pull it up on screen for TV viewers, but radio listeners, about a month ago. Didn't his uh, Obama's brother back out of the film because of threats? Yeah, this was his other brother, Mark. So Obama's uh, brother, George, uh, is living in third world poverty. But Mark went to Stanford and Emory Business School and now lives in China. He's an entrepreneurial guy. By the way, he's very pro-business. Uh, he and Obama had a big fight over Obama's dad. Obama idolized the dad that he never knew. This other fellow, Mark, who lived with the dad, said, no, this guy's a terrible guy. He's an alcoholic. He beats my mother. Uh, so Obama has grown up in a fantasy world. And and he's never, he's never escaped the fantasy because he's been coddled all his life by sycophants and people who've told him what a genius he is. So he's finally come to believe it. He does stuff thinking he has an unerring political instinct like this Bergdahl thing. Then it jumps up to bite him and then he, need, he needs the media to start covering for him. So we're in an incredibly embarrassing political situation nationwide we've got a total embarrassment in the white house but no one can really say that because so many people in our press want the first african-american so desperately to succeed that they're in a sense in a shameful task of covering up for him and they are scared of your film undoubtedly uh, the good news is the book's already out and i believe it's available now uh, i just got my copy uh this morning so i've not had a chance to read it yet uh, uh, tell us about dinesh d'souza's a uh, new book, America Imagined a World Without Her. Okay, we just lost an essay. Well, the book actually is the intellectual spine. Hello? It's okay, Dinesh. Yeah. Uh, your, your, your Skype was breaking up a little bit. Go ahead and start over about your book. Yeah, I was saying the book uh, is the intellectual spine for the film, uh, and it takes on the central argument of American progressivism, which is that the wealth of America, including your wealth, mine, and all the stuff we have in our house, all this stuff right here, is based on theft. Uh, and this is an audacious, outrageous argument, but it's the whole idea is that everything we got is stolen. We stole the country from the Native Americans. We stole the labor of the African Americans. We stole half of Mexico. Capitalism is theft. So this idea uh, is based on the notion that the federal government now is doing nothing more than restoring stolen goods. It has every right to take our stuff because our stuff doesn't really belong to us. Obama and Elizabeth Warren and all these characters have been hammering this argument now for six years. And it hasn't really been argued, it hasn't been taken on head on. So that's what I do in the book. I, I answer this wealth critique and I make a moral defense of America and the free market. Well, I haven't read the book yet, and I haven't seen the film, but when I saw the trailer before you were indicted, I mean, I got a pretty clear guess of where it was going to really look at 
all the different sides, but to also point out this was the age of conquest when this country got formed. It was all different sides battling each other, different native groups against other natives, the French with one native group, the British with another, uh, the Spanish. I mean, it was just ongoing. There were six flags over Texas. Uh, you know, the American system was better than all the others. That's why it prevailed in an age of barbarism. And I don't romanticize it, except for the fact that in an age of squalor, it was heads above the rest. And, and, and the ideas of freedom were never fully realized then and still haven't been realized. But the attempt to realize them uh, created the greatest liberty and productivity the world's ever seen. The idea of wealth creation is itself an invention. Historically, people got wealth by taking it from other people. It reminds me of when I was a kid in India, I'd go to school with like 10 marbles in my pocket. None of us had any money, so the only way to get more marbles was to take somebody else's marbles. Um, America came up with a different idea, which is that you can make stuff, you can take, uh, you can make silicon con out of sand uh, so you can through innovation and technology and creativity generate new wealth now when the white man came to america and by the way you know people often blame america for columbus and for the spanish conquistadors and for what the british did let's remember that columbus came in 1492 that's 200 years before america uh, so america gets saddled with all these crimes that preceded america uh, and yet when the europeans came here every indian tribe just about every Native American tribe that was occupying land had in fact seized that land by force from somebody else. So that this conquest ethic, as you very aptly call it, was on both sides. Uh, and what America brought into the world was an alternative to conquest. So what's going on in our schools is what I call the shaming of America. And it's a progressive left-wing scheme to rip off America. You need to shame people and make them feel a sense of guilt so you can slam them up against the wall when you come to take their TV and their couch and their car you then accuse them of having stolen goods and this is sort of the the racket that I'm blowing the whistle on in this book and in this film exactly they project all of these distorted crimes some of which happened some of which didn't on people hundreds of years later I mean that's beyond the authoritarian idea of your neighbor steals something in the old Soviet Union so you get sent to the gulag too it's beyond that it's so outrageous and now Seven billion third world people, if we took the smartest and the best of the world from all over the planet, from Japan to India, from Russia to Germany to Mexico, from, from Africa to you know Nigeria, wherever, that would be great like Switzerland has done. But instead, if you're poor and have leprosy, uh, or you want to have your baby for free, or, or, or you're poor, put your kid on a plane, Obama will take them. This is like a military attack. And now we have a federal judge today saying... Obama's not enforcing the law, uh, and another 230,000 kids are on the way. Mr. D'Souza, this appears to be a full-out, this is so over the top, I can't even believe this is happening. You know, I'm an immigrant, and I always, I love America. Um, as an immigrant, I always knew I was coming from the corner of the world to the center. Uh, I always came here to embrace the American dream and the American way of life. Uh, far from sort of turning America into a sort of ethnic smorgasbord, I always wanted to assimilate to the high principles of America. And what I, what's strange now is the way in which what the Obama people seem to to do is they don't seem to want productive, creative immigrants who are going to, in a sense, pull the wagon. They want guys who are going to come and sit in the wagon. That's because that's their people. Uh, and so we are in living in a, in a morally inverted society in which uh, Obama goes to the people sitting in the wagon. He goes, you're the most morally wonderful people in America. And he looks at all the people pulling the wagon and he goes, you're greedy, you're selfish, you're materialistic. You got to pull harder. So think of what, what this does to America's morale. It basically convinces people who are pulling the wagon and went, gee, maybe I should go sit in the wagon because life seems to be a lot more comfortable in there. Isn't this classic Cloward and Piven? I mean, I know Cloward and Piven came out in the 60s, but the, the communists and socialists had always wanted to collectivize farms to control the population, control the food. I mean, it was always about control. And really, uh, I mean, I think the evidence is overwhelming. They want to wreck the economy to then control it. They want to break eggs to make an omelet, to quote Joseph Stalin. You know, I think where the Republicans are out to lunch is that they, they say, oh, you know, 
these liberals, they're, you know what, they're well-meaning. It's just that their policies don't work. And then we get lengthy exegesis about how Obamacare doesn't work and the capitalist system is good and too much regulation is bad. Look, the thing we don't realize is that progressivism is driven by very powerful human motives, primarily the motive of envy. Obama is seeds with envy and resentment. Part of the reason is he doesn't want to live in a society where the entrepreneur is at center stage. The entrepreneur has skills that Obama does not even begin to have. Obama couldn't even begin to invent the iPhone. In fact, the guy can't even put up a website. But Obama does have other skills. Is he can work up a mob. He knows how to mobilize resentment through his community organizing or resentment organizing skills. So Obama would like to see a transfer of power away from the productive entrepreneurial class toward the resentful intellectual and political class. Uh, and that's and, and most people don't see that. They think that he's, a, he's basically trying to divide up the pie fairly. But it was Alinsky who instructed Obama and even Hillary, listen, always go after power, but pretend to care about morality. Master the language of fairness so you can get everybody to go into a stupor. Uh, and in the meantime, you relentlessly engage in a Machiavellian pursuit of power. I think we're coming full circle because obviously the American system wasn't perfect. If you study the real history from the French, German, British, uh, Native American perspective, I mean, it's pretty much what you're you know, uh, putting in your book, coming out in your film. It's just the reality of looking at the time people lived that it was a free market system mixed with the old conquest, but it was revolutionary that we were bringing the flower, the tail end of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment into a new world where the frontier could be pushed away from government, where real freedom could flourish, and everybody wanted to come here from around the world because you could transcend your caste, transcend you know the group that you had to be what your dad was if you grew up in Italy, say, or you grew up in Germany, and you could be whatever you could really do, and it was about what you stood for in a free market. They're now calling it liberalism, but it's the opposite of Jefferson because it truly is mob rule and ideology over true free market. It, it, it is the purest, most sickening gangsterism I've ever seen. And I got to say, sir, I've seen a lot of interviews with you, had you on the broadcast before, but since you've been persecuted, you've gotten more focused, more hardcore. And when we're facing the radicalism of the kleptocratic authoritarian left, we need to raise our rhetoric to the level of reality and I, you've been very gentlemanly, very scholarly in a lot of shows I've seen. Lately, you've been on fire. And I think that's because you've now gone through a new level of persecution. And I think if the socialists think that we're weak, they have no idea as they try to really persecute us, what is going to happen? What do you predict for America's future? Do you think now truly seeing the face of socialism and progressivism that we could have a new uh, golden era of Americana again? I certainly think that we can beat these guys. You know, um, when I was in college, my professor once told me about the story of the lion tamer and the lion. And so here's the lion tamer with his little stick prancing around, and he gets the lion to do exactly what he wants. But the professor said, wait a minute, Dinesh, who is more powerful, the lion tamer or the lion? In reality, the lion is more powerful but the lion doesn't know that. So the progressives are the lion tamer. They think they have us intimidated and cowed. They think we're gonna do whatever they want, but we need to realize that the real power is with us. We actually outnumber them, and if we'll be organized and fight smart in the way that they do, we'll crush them. So yes, I have to some degree, if they've been trying to silence me, they totally have picked on the wrong guy, because that's not gonna work with me. Uh, and I'm only it only redoubles my enthusiasm to be determined uh, and outspoken in speaking my point of view. So yes, this film is gonna be a real weapon if you will in the war of ideas. Um, and they have every reason to be alarmed because when people go in the theater and see this film, they're gonna be blown away by the hidden history of America that is factual, but is excluded from the textbooks because the progressives don't want us to know it. Yeah, I mean, I'm part Native American myself, so I'm not demonizing them, but they would come on the East Coast and say, to both sides, the French or the British, if you don't help us, we're gonna wage war on you and destroy 20 towns. I mean, you're gonna help us go kill this other group of natives because they were acting just like Europeans. People are just people. And just to deify Native Americans and act like they're God is just another progressive fraud. DineshaSouza.com, is that the best place for folks to find the book online, sir? Yeah, the book's available.
available at barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, certainly dineshdesouza.com for all kinds of information. Our movie, America, the movie.com, and look for it July 2nd. It's all right, be, Dinesh, uh, we're out of time. Promise to come back when the film comes out. Love to do it, Alex. A, a true political prisoner. A, a, thank you so much, sir. They want to make him a political prisoner, folks. He's a cause.